Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this live in conversation event with internationally renowned and acclaimed artist Samson Kambalu and Modern Art Oxford's curator extraordinaire, Emma Ridgway. My name is Wes Williams. I'm the director of Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, and I'm really thrilled to be introducing this evening's live event in collaboration with Modern Art Oxford. We're bringing you this event as part of the Humanities Knowledge Exchange Fellowship Program here in Oxford, in conjunction with Samson's hugely significant solo show, which has just opened at Modern Art Oxford, a show called New Liberia. The idea for tonight's event sprang from a series of seminars led by Samson Kambalu as part of his Knowledge Exchange Fellowship. These seminars explored the drawings and work of John Ruskin, and I'm delighted to say that tonight's event, uh, tonight's conversation, Samson and Emma will talk about the impact of those seminars on Samson's new solo show. Before I hand over to Emma to tell you more, I'd just like to remind you that you can share comments and questions in the chat section on YouTube just below the screen. I will be back at the end of their conversation to chair the Q&A, so feel free to post your questions and I will try to, my best to put as many as I can to both the speakers. So, without further delay, I'd like to welcome to the screen Emma Ridgway. Hello, Emma. Emma is Chief Curator at Modern Art Oxford, bringing a history of international experience to leading the artistic program of exhibitions and learning here at Modern Art Oxford, or here in Oxford, since 2015. She's also the curator for the British Pavilion, the 59th International Exhibition at La Biennale di Venezia, 2022. In other words, it's hard to think of anyone better qualified to introduce Samson and then to engage in this evening's conversation. Over to you, Emma. Thank you, Wes. And hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, so Samson Kambalu, as some of you will know, is one of South East Africa's most significant contemporary artists. He's best recognized for his profoundly playful films and installations. And through New Liberia, this big new exhibition we have, he really asks how our individual freedoms can manifest or be curtailed by a specific place and moment in history in which we live in. Uh, so New Liberia, we can see some slides of that. It's a series of four installations through the gallery and explores notions of social freedom. So this first gallery presents an initiation ceremony, and that is for today's new era, a shift Kambali proposes in attitudes towards a positive move uh, in social justice. Visitors, as you may be able to see here, are greeted by two Niao elephant chiefs and they're heralded by multinational flags with cinema signs that promote acts of art making. Next slide. And here the, uh, and, thank you. And here the spiritual and academic community rituals merge as the drawing elephants, um, combining aspects of Samson's childhood observations and research and also life in Ruskin as a professor. They're made of cut up Oxford University gowns that evoke ancestral wisdom. We'll talk about that more in this talk. And that's the link to the Ruskin seminars and conversations that Samson and I have had over quite a period of time. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, so central to the middle gallery uh, is a sculpture that Samson uh, Kambali proposes for the empty fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, London, and it celebrates the national hero of Malawian independence, John Chilembwe, uh, who called for a second Liberia, um, for Malawi to become independent and led an uprising in 1915, but that was 50 years before British rule um, uh, finished in Malawi and a republic was declared. Next slide. This shows further images of his church, as was destroyed by British officials. Next slide. In this smaller gallery, uh, Samson Kambalu shows 
um, idea of a cell which houses his Sanguinetti thesis from 2015. Next slide, please. And also shows a reenactment of the court case that um, happened as a result of his initial showing of the Sanguinetti thesis. Next slide. This is the final gallery. It's a large space. Next slide, which shows the um, Nai cinema that Sampson is well known for. And in that Sampson's, in this gallery, Sampson's really showing expressions of individual freedoms in public space as joyfully transgressive acts. In his films, he performs as a liberated everyman and, and wittily demonstrates really how creative forms of freedom can spark a social connection. And here on the central podium that we're playing around on here, visitors are invited to briefly reenact aspects of the inquiry into the 1915 uprising and very specifically around the politics of being allowed to wear your hat as you please in a public space, which at that time with a character such as John Chilembwe was not only a representation of personal freedom, but also a form of colonial resistance. So it's my pleasure to introduce Samson Kambali now. Um, so Samson Kambali um, was, um, <laughs> Samson Kambali um, was born in Chiradzulu district in Malawi in 1975. And it's valuable to note that he is born into the first generation to be born into the public of Malawi. And that was after 60 years of colonial rule. And self-determination via education was very much a political priority for the newly independent country. It's very much characterized Samson's life, but it was also a big priority in the Kambalu family household. Um, Samson attended the Kamuza Academy, which in Bilawi um, was a, this education was very selective at that time with the intention of very much educating the population. Three of the top students were picked from each district and Samson was one of those from his district who was um, invited to study at that unusual school, which is based on a British school model. And Following that, at the University of Malawi, Samson introduced conceptual art as a form of practice. And then on moving to the UK in 2008, uh, Samson authored a memoir of growing up in the era uh, of President Banda, which is a fascinating combination of different heritages and syncretic or eclectic uh, confluence of influences. His artworks have been exhibited around the world uh, notably, fe they featured in All the World's Futures at the Venice Biennale in 2015, curated by Aquinesa. And his solo presentations include the Whitechapel Gallery in London 2018, Pier Gallery and Musite in Ostend, Belgium in 2020. And his, Samson's work is represented in the National Collections of Tate, British Council and Contemporary Art Society. His research fellowships include the Yale, and Smithsonian Institute. And as many of you know, he's now an associate professor at the Ruskin School of Art and a fellow of Magdalen College at the University of Oxford. And so as you will have gathered, his major solo exhibition is currently on at Modern Art Oxford. And also Samson has proposed a sculpture for the Trafalgar Square Empty Plinth and an exhibition open today, which is the short fourth plinth shortlist exhibition at the National Gallery. Samson's one of six artists exhibited there. And he also has a major display of flags at the South Bank Centre in London opening and soon has a solo exhibition at Kate McGallery Gallery in London opening too. Samson, it'd be great to hear you say a few words about your Modern Art Oxford show. Uh, thanks for a very good introduction. I think it's the best one I've had to date. Never spare concise. Thanks so much. And for inviting me to do this solo show with you. I feel I turned up at the right time. You're also curating the British Pavilion. I, I, it couldn't get better than that in terms of a curator for my show. So I'm really, I feel very lucky. Um, yeah. Um, 
I have known Emma for quite a while since I moved to Oxford four years ago. She's been invite. She had been inviting me to openings there to, uh, and so and we we started on a conversation, and then a few years later she taught me that she would do this. She would like to do a solo show with me, and around the same time, I also got this invitation from um, the mayor's office from London, the L London mayor's office. Uh, inviting me to propose for the fourth plinth, uh, which I did as part of a long list. And then months later, I was informed that I've made it to the last six, which was very exciting. Uh, this development for me helped to shape this solo show. It, it informed me, it, I was inspired to, 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 to uh, structure this show around John Chilembe, the very same figure that I've proposed for um, for the fourth plinth. John Chilembe basically is the first, like one of the first Malawians or first Africans to, to die fighting against colonialism, not as part of a tribe, but simply as a modern African who wanted to be free to be equal to the colonials, to be equal to Europeans. And he teamed up with uh, friends he had made in America, black Americans, African Americans, who sponsored the building of his church in the country as a political thing. And uh, yeah, so he was able to build this magnificent church, uh, which was as good as any in the country. And at the time, only white missionaries were allowed to build a mission. So when he put this together, it was a statement. Anyway, Chilembe has inspired me, my work. He was always there in my work, in the undercurrent. Um, his use of photography to effect. If you look at all his photographs, they're always effective. They are passed on to us. I've always known them. And I suppose maybe I was responding to their magic one way or the other in my films. And uh, so I thought at this time, I'll bring him to the forefront. Usually uh, figures of Malawian modernism or Malawian secretary culture that are at work in, uh, that inspire my work are usually in the subterranean kind of undercurrent. Mm -hmm. This time I brought them to the fore and starting here with John Chilempe uh, and, and his two figures on a plinth. Uh, his friend Chole who supported him is a smaller figure. But I see him as a kind of cursor, you know? Um, this uh, uh, sculpture for me animates. You have to look at it as you go around it. It animates like a, one of my films, really. The, the figure, I feel like there's, when you go around these two figures, there's a tango between them. And for me, the sculpture comes out, the antelope comes out around this tango for recognition. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so I thought I would put that in the middle gallery. And I've always spoken to Emma saying that I consider the middle gallery where Chile and, and Choi are associated as antelope, as um, like a projection room. And I've conceived this uh, cinema, this solo show as a kind of cinema palace. So when you walk in, first thing you see is elephants, then you see the Chile and room, you see my research, and then you, you, you fall into the, uh, the, the theater and, then, and you, just, you see the film. But the idea of masking is very much Chilembe. Chilembe means um, antelope and Chilembe is also potent in Malawi in that it's, it's a name of a womb mask. One of the ancient masks, prehistoric, it's Kasia Malio, the principal uh, Nyao mask, which is a womb, you know, it's actually a womb uh, disguised as an antelope. And uh, so that's why these two men on the plinth are the same. And so when you walk in, uh, when Emma showed me this first room, which is a huge, uh, the, the, the upper gallery, I was like, what, what do I do in, in here? Eventually I thought of elephant because I was thinking of a lot of masks at the time because of Chile Embe. and I saw this magnificent, magnificent uh, you know, mass nyao structure in this book 
of masks from Malawi and Jovo. And it just looked like some form of Oxford Dawn or something, these robes falling down it. So I used mm. that. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Samson. That was really the so the fourth plinth. Uh, it's one of the things we talked about quite a lot as well as drawing out some of the different characters who've who've been inspiration and also because uh, way before the show we had multiple conversations about different ideas and um, both have a sort of um, kind of interested specific aspects of philosophy and also uh, interest in in John Ruskin actually, which was something that I was looking at for a different project uh, altogether. And we got chatting about it, of course, because of the Ruskin School. So that was one of the different ways that the ideas kind of bounced off each other in uh, interesting ways. I think it's useful for people to um, understand in a second, we'll just show a video um, around the concept of New Liberia. It's useful for people to for those who aren't familiar with the, this particular aspect of um, traditional Chiwa um, culture within Milawi. Um, I'll just say a couple of things about it because the references will come up again and again, which is um, that uh, the Niao are a secret society within uh, a particular aspect of Chiwa culture, who are the largest populace in Milawi. Um, and one of their roles is to perform short energetic dances for the traditional Gul Wam Kulu, which means the great dance, as in the universal great dance of life. And in that they create and they wear masks, uh, which are like costumes made from cut up materials in their environment. And when they come and do their amazing energetic performances, some of which you can see online, um, they're communicating and transmitting uh, um, ancestral wisdom is the simplest way to describe it, with the aim of really generating harmonious communities at times of transition. And so when Samson's referring to the antelope, that's one of the costumes, in fact, the main costume, the most powerful costume, important costume, who's the mother goddess. And the elephant is the kind of second most important in terms of being a figure of authority in terms of what it's conveying. And so John uh, Ruskin kind of comes through that idea of evoking ancestral wisdom. And if we could show uh, the video, it's just a short video to introduce some of the ideas Samson's touched on as well around the title, New Liberia. So Samson Kambalu, here we are in your new exhibition New Liberia at Modern Art Oxford. Could you start, please, by telling us about the concept around this exhibition that's really playing with the notion of social freedom? Yeah. New Liberia is actually uh, a utopia that comes from my research on early 20th century Malawian modernism and um, syncretic culture. You know. These things are at the heart of my art practice. Right? My filmmaking, my multimedia works, a lot of the ideas that I've uh, employed come from this secretive area of research. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the idea of New Liberia belongs to a freedom fighter in the early 20th century Malawian uh, uh, preacher and Pan-Africanist. He, he read an uprising against colonial rule in, in, in 1915. Um, and his idea was to end injustices, colonial injustices, and turn Malawi into a new Liberia. So the concept of new Liberia is harking back to this hero of Malawian independence, John Chilembwe, yeah. who was himself was harking back to the formation of Liberia, which yeah. was the first, well, the earliest republic in Africa that was actually set up with huge amounts of uh, support and instigation from America, in fact, and the idea yeah. of equal rights and Africa for Africans that was coming there. So that kind of conversation between America and Africa and also a uh, relationship with British colonialism and beyond. Yes, he was inspired, in America he was in 
inspired by a lot of uh, uh, emancipation movements, you know, like of John Brown, of Nat Turner, and, and the like. And um, so, yeah, this is, uh, he's working under, not only with the help of American, uh, African-American sponsors, but also their ideas is, is trying to, you know. And ideas yeah. like self-respect and yeah. the idea of self-government. Yeah, and equality, self-governance, um, dignity, self-respect, sovereignty. Mm -hmm. A lot of Chilean ideas of equality are coming from this tradition that's built around masking, the Nyao masking. So Chilean is taking ideas both from Nyao masking of his native Malawi and uh, from, from his international influences, Pan-Africanist influences from, uh, uh, from America. Yeah, names like Booker T. Washington. <clears throat> and he's combining these ideas to come up with this uh, utopia, this, this idea of new Liberia. Yeah. So Chilembe is significant in that he was the first uh, Malawian, if you like, to resist colonialism, not under the name of a tr any particular tribe, but as a modern person, as a modern man. Yeah. Uh, and he's the first Pan-Africanist, actually, to die in Africa doing so. So it was a real ahead of his time, because he was thinking now beyond the old networks, tribal networks, to more kind of a more modern, unified um, Malawi. And this particular moment that we're in now as well, you felt that there is a sea change, a shift, a genuine shift in attitudes as regards social justice at the moment. Would you speak a bit about that? I'm inspired by methods of resistance of those times to address issues that I face now. Some of those issues, let's say racial justice, uh, fight for recognition for everybody, dignity, uh, yeah. Equality, uh, those are the issues that Richard Embo was fighting for. And so I go back to that time. These people are fighting and learn from them and borrow aspects. So that was with the two of us standing in the exhibition last week and also with my co curator, Amy Budd. So there's been many people who brought to fruition this exhibition. I'll just mention a few of them now. Um, so it starts an exchange of ideas and an exhibition, and there's different roles that people play in the bringing about of a show. So as you've heard, Samson and I talk very much about ideas and concepts and then bringing those into how they might manifest in the gallery. Um, my colleague Amy Budd was looking very much at the production side of the exhibition and also working with our colleagues in the production team, Scott Blythe, Andy Owens, as well as uh, Jess Roberts, to kind of bring things into life. And um, there was also, we'll go on later to talk about some of the specific making of the elephants. I also uh, would like to point out that the exhibition has been very generously supported by Torch, of course, and Modern Art Oxford's Commissioning Circle, and also the John Fell Oxford University Fund too, and Kate McGarry Gallery. Um, and it's, yeah, it'd be good to speak a little about, could we see the PowerPoint images, please, of the elephant to focus on that a little? Yeah, Samson, would you speak to this uh, original image that you sent through to me initially around the elephants when that idea sprang to mind? Yes, um, you can hear me, yeah? Yes. I, I can, yeah. Um, <clears throat> basically, this is uh, th this the masking. Th this tradition for me when I was growing up in Malawi, it's everywhere. It still is. I was filming the boy who harnessed the wind uh, with Chiweto Ajuofo two years ago for the BBC, and uh, 
it's the masks are just teaming up. They're not, there's no <laughs> let up actually. I thought that maybe I've been in Malawi for a few years, few years now, and maybe the traditional is ebbing away, but actually it's it's just there. It's it's been this tradition has seen so many people have come to Malawi, Asians, uh Europeans, Arabs, and people going to Africa for different vegetables. They go in and settle in. And usually they are changed by this loud on the other way around. And uh, so I studied this throughout with my art education. When I went to a Western art, you know, I had I did a Western art education, GCSEs, A levels. But every time my teacher asked to do a project, I would always do a project on Yao. I did it at GCSEs, I did it at A levels, I did it in university, I've done it for my PhD, I did it in plain clothes as a chewa. Uh, it, it's something that I've been trying to get my head around. It's infinite in its kind of richness. So, um, yeah, I just thought this image, usually I have. Of, of a catalog of these masks. You grew up with them. It's part of the Chewa language. You know, it's part of, you know, it, these masks record Malawian history. Basically, you can uh, trace in the, the, there are all kinds of masks made, slave traders, um, uh, colonials, um, chiefs, academics, judges, they're all in there, politicians. They all end up in this pool of masks. So when I'm called to do something, usually I, I sometimes revisit these masks. And when I looked up, when I was flicking through my this book on Malawi masks by one compiled by uh, Father Boucher, uh, who was my mentor when I was doing my A levels, uh, he's also a Nyao initiate. He's a Canadian priest, Catholic priest, but also an initiate into this uh, secret society. Uh, he put this book together and I've, I came across this and I thought this is just perfect for Oxford. It just looked like this is it, these gowns, these billowing gowns. And I thought if I could do something close to something what's happened to this would have been good. And that's what we did. So I, uh, I, I, I asked for funding from John Fell and Torch and surprisingly I got it. I told these guys Sorry, I told the, 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 the panels that uh, I would I want to lots of uh, MA gowns that the fellows wear. Yeah. And I would like to turn them into this Nyao mask. And I got a positive response since that's how we managed to secure funding for this. Uh, and I also put this to my students during the Raskin seminars, which I thought I would develop around the building of these elephants yeah. from my conversation with Emma. A raskin is interesting for me. Maya, can we have the next slide? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, for me, my understanding of Raskin's take on education is close to his ideas of drawing. Uh, education, not merely as a, a way of transmitting facts, but it's also uh, teaching a way of being in the world, you know? Um, this Ruskin's ideas in education went beyond the utility into poetry. Sometimes his ideas and writing reminded me of the teachings around Yao masking. For instance, his emphasis on the partial thing, how the partial thing relates to the whole and how the whole itself is indeed partial. Mm -hmm. And this is um, very much Yao thinking. Yao thinking mm -hmm. actually the, the way I like, the reason I like it, and I'm, I have no doubt why it's a UNESCO World Heritage, it's because it's more a science. Uh, uh, Nyao is pre-metaphysics. It's, it's built more from the observation. We, in Malawi, we have other religions that are metaphysical, you know, that try to articulate God, whatever. But the difference, Nyao differs in that its approach is totally scientific. Nyao develops from observation of nature it answers that. So the partial thing is what these guys in Africa too have dwelled on. It's something, the partial thing that's being appreciated now in quantum physics, that perhaps reality is ever partial. This is what it's also uh, Ruskin is pointing at, that if you look carefully, everything's in, connected to infinity. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I decided to do this and I, I, I cut up one arm of my gown 
and gave it to the elephants and I had other people also donate their guns to, to us. Uh, some we bought thanks to the generous donation from John Farrell and Torch. And uh, we built these things and um, uh, Ruskin students helped me. And there was also Anna Tut, uh, uh, in, yeah. a seamstress, uh, helped me put this together. There was also Andy and Scott who built the frame for these elephants, uh, these terrific technicians at Modern Art. And so it was a group, the uh, Oxford community coming together yeah. uh, to realize. Absolutely. So, we, so this is the, some of the images, just to give people a bit of a sense of the sequence. So Samson sent me this image originally uh, and then worked it up. Uh, actually, that's, that multi-slide is good, uh, Maya, thank you. So we're talking a little about the structure here, uh, just so you understand uh, some of the ways these things work. So Samson uh, researched, and as he said, that idea really came together in this particular mask, the elephant mask, which would have originally one person standing in each leg and they a person to perform and they'd shuffle in quite slowly into the kind of central space for the dance performance with the uh, trunk swirling, our trunk goes up and down. Uh, so initially it was a case of measuring up how tall it should be. Uh, there is Scott and Andy there uh, with uh, Samson in the gallery when we were all discussing it in the space. We were measuring up against Andy. He's the tallest in our team in the exhibitions uh, and learning team. So he's a good measure. He also was a, uh, used to work in a zoo and used to look after elephants. So that turned out to be very handy knowledge indeed. And actually something he mentioned just the other day was whilst this elephant can look quite abstract to people like me and many others who are not familiar with elephants. He said, when you, are, when you work with elephants a lot to him, it looks a very accurate representation of an elephant because they don't have kind of neck formations. Their head is part of their body. And he felt working with this structure that it was very familiar to him from actually having worked with live elephants, which is a little insight, which I love. So uh, with Seb Thomas as well, um, the three of them worked quite hard on designing, working out how to make this structure. And as you can see, constructed it from wood, also how to make it move, but not move too much. Um, and that is uh, the black and white image is when the structure is pretty much made. You can see the ear templates down on the ground there. And the trunk is being demonstrated uh, to Samson and they're working out kind of what level um, it should be at and its movability. Can we have the next slide? Um, yeah. Thanks. And Anne, uh, Amy, Bud, uh, very brilliantly um, working with uh, Jess Robertson, our fab assistant curator as well, um, found Anne Tut, who's a costume maker in Oxford, to work with her, for her and Samson to work on how to transform and create the skin of the elephant together. So this was made, again, in situ in the spaces in the gallery. And also Amy and Jess worked on inviting the uh, students who worked on this as well. So there's about 15 different students, thank you so much, who came through essentially the Ruskin seminar that we've done previously um, and seen the kind of talk and the ideas forming in those discussions at which uh, Samson's performance lecture was that he ch 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 cut off a section of his gown live, which of course is part of the elephant. And so here you can kind of see the different elephant aspects being discussed. Um, I think it might be useful to see, there's a video of a short video of the sort of making behind the scenes, which could be good to see. Sorry, one of the students was yeah. making this trunk yesterday. Oh. Just, uh, seeing the so I don't know, they might not use it, they may use them as they are, but um, okay. my name's Anne, and I am a, um, I suppose, a costume designer, you might call me, or a maker. Um, and so um, I make um, a lot of things, but generally they tend to be more clothes on people. Um, but I also do have a little bit of experience with upholstery, which has helped. Uh, with this job. These are master's gowns. Um, yeah, so they, uh, Oxford's very sort of uh, specific about what gowns use. 
we make sure that we had the right ones. Um, and yeah, so they're master's gowns, but they've all been uh, deconstructed and then sewn back together to make these um, skins. There's, there's kind of a skeleton, there's basically a skeleton sort of plywood um, shell uh, that they made here. And then we came and just um, covered it in a sort of wadding and then put another skin on it and then put the final sort of skin of gowns onto it. Yeah, we actually, we bought 40. Because to begin with, uh, we weren't, uh, you know, it, it's changed a little bit how we were going to do it. And actually the legs were very draped. They were taking sort of four gowns to begin with. Um, and that's changed a little bit. So the students have been amazing, actually. Uh, are completely uh, brilliant. We've just like whizzed on. And um, I think uh, they quite enjoy it because it's quite, uh, sewing's quite meditative and, and slow. And I think a lot of them are in like their final year. So that we have a really busy thinking time outside of this. It's actually quite nice to... And so, and the other nice thing is that the elephants then have had so many people, you know, make them. Um, uh, my name is uh, Michael Woods, and I'm one of the uh, MFA students at the uh, Ruskin School of Art. Um, I'm not at all um, skilled at sewing, but it's really awesome to be able to still have a hands-on experience helping. Part of what we're doing at the Ruskin, um, uh, I'm one of uh, many. Uh, representatives for an anti-racist initiative and part of that, that work is contextualizing and decolonizing the university um, and so simply the um, the gesture the, the cut the reorganization reorientation of a gown that in itself has uh, stood for so much uh, sort of white supremacy and, and colonial rule um, the, the university itself um, to be able to, to reconfigure it in this way is, is really awesome. I'm Sarah Catterall. I'm a BFA 2 student at the Ruskin School of Art, and today I've been sewing the legs of the elephants. The right way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just, um, there was just, just one piece. Yeah, right. okay. Ever since he's done the lectures and explained what the project was about, I've just been really fascinated by the idea of the masks and um, using the gowns as well for to make these gigantic creatures just a wonderful idea I think I mean I wish I could do this every day of my life just you know chill in a museum and install I love that final line mm -hmm. <laughs> so not chilled when you're installing a show I mean, it's very organised and everything has to be done at a certain pace, but it's quite intense as well because you've had these concepts and ideas following lots of different conversations and then it's like bringing it all together, bringing it all together until that last moment, when it's a new commission like this, until that last moment, actually almost when people come through the door, right, Samson, you know, of kind of, you know, I'm writing the interpretation, I'm doing it just before the work's finished, actually. So there's a lot of kind of best guess almost still in there as to, how the experience will read. Um, yeah, but it was a really fascinating show to put together and will really excite audiences and well worth exploring more. Samson, would you say a few words about, um, yeah, your kind of sense of the elephants in terms of their conveying of different ideas? Yes, so um, my understanding, yeah, um, is well. I think my, my, first. I have to say, I'm, I'm, I was still watching this video with you, and uh, I was, I was, you know, <laughs> it's all there. But I can add a few things, um, uh, which is why masking. You know, for instance, this mysterious thing. Why masking? Um, well. It, it's it, they they do not an interest that I have making art, which is the notion of the problematic of the gifts. Um, you know, um, African societies are still in Southern Africa based around this notion of the gift. It's called under development here, but I can tell you that. Africa, Southern Africa is the way it is. It's not just because it's passive, it's actually actively resistant. <laughs> Africans have developed this new philosophy for hundreds of years. 
it's it's the it's a place in my opinion that has successively resisted capital for a long long time <laughs> you know everybody has tried in africa but africa is one part where capital doesn't have an easy an easy ride um basically the, the, it's wisdom received wisdom that the gift has a a way of putting people in obligation of, of, of leading to exchange. Because basically if you give something to somebody, you put them under obligation, they have to return that gift to you. But the return of that gift, it's seen as a cancellation of the gift. So if I give you a gift and you give me back the gift of cancel, we are done, you know? Like for instance, I'll give you an example that it's considered rude to say, thank you, especially to your parents or to your friends. Here, people get upset when you, uh, when you don't say thank you, when you give them something and you don't say thank you, people get upset here. But in African society, you see, if people hear too many thank yous, they, they think you're severing a tie with them. So the best way, most of the time, especially with your parents, just to receive and not say thank you. Because saying thank you is severing, is canceling that debt. Um, but anyway, to, to, to avoid this, uh, it's important that the community sustain an atmosphere of generosity, a childlike atmosphere. Children get into this zone I'm talking about of generosity, of indifferent gift giving. Uh, but for adults under necessity, it's much harder. So basically mass come out to generate this atmosphere of generosity. When the mass come out, people are able to give and take without obligation. You know, they are able to live in this generous. And for me, I, I see the aspects of this in the wake of Raskin. This is how he sees what drawing means. Drawings, drawing for Raskin led to a certain generosity of uh, uh, well, being in the world. He, 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 write, he writes his essay, and to the last, he, he proposes Venice as, as this seat of generosity. He, he sees that it's a big relationship between art and the economics of generosity. Um, this, you know, Africa is already in touch with, like in Malawi. So this is what's happened. If you are wanting to create an alternative society, let's say to capital <laughs> or exchange, inevitably play has to come into the fore. Mm -hmm. And when play comes into the fore, uh, creativity follows. And when creativity follows, basking is also inevitable. Um, yeah, so this is a uh, new Liberia proposes this utopia of, 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 of the economy of the gift that runs, that finds places of expression even within uh, networks of capital that we have now. It's still possible to, to find. Um, and you can see already that the making of these elephants for me has connected me to so many people. I mean, uh, I was in awe of the expressions, uh, the, the, how the students understand this work, how Andy. Uh, had, and this input into working with elephants. So there's all these experiences, the elephants bring me together. It, it has connected me, as you can see, so many level with research, with my colleagues, research, with students, with the community around us, with modern art. And by the way, modern art Oxford is the first time they've shown uh, an Oxford tutor. It's an international place, uh, modern art Oxford. Uh, but somehow I've managed, I think, to make this connection that, that, that I think the elephants are as important uh, for, for, for my connection at Oxford as they will be important uh, as, as part of my uh, continued research into art and the economy of the gifts as an international artist. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that connection, but you can see what play can do, what creative can, creativity can do, that, that, that it's a real working philosophy. It, it, it does, creativity does break down a lot of walls. It does create, generate this atmosphere of generosity that leads to connection. Mm. And one of the things you've spoken about is the New Liberia describes, as we all will recognize and can make more of, the, that innate uh, freedom that we each have as well, to be free and expressive within public space or in the world, as well as respecting that the 
gift economy, which, as you say, is so dominant in the matrilineal traditional countries that still have that as a socially strong, no longer economically, but socially strong uh, form of exchange and engagement. Um, the idea of that things kind of will come back round at some point, but the point is to be generous into the world and also to recognise kind of the freedoms that you do have to uh, kind of embrace those and respect those around you. Yeah, like when I'm in public, basically making my films, it's the same principle of creativity and connection. When I'm traveling, my films that are, have extended from this tradition of masking, by the way, uh, in Malawian modernism, film and photography was very big. I'm not surprised that Chile and before effect to communicate with these people, he uses photography. He, for instance, the photograph of that that are, that are based my marquee for the fourth thing is, is he wears a hat, and he distributed this photograph of him wearing a hat next to a white person. It's a friend of his supported him in his cause and stands with them to wear a hat, and uh, and distributes. And again, this. Uh, uh, adds to his movement. Basically that's what creative do. And when I'm traveling, I just carry with me a digital camera and I walk, let's say a city, a landscape. And then I, I ask strangers to stop and film me. And then I do this abstract performance before them. And it's this abstract performance that leads them to follow me. Usually after filming me, they say, what are you gonna do with this? What are you doing? How, how can I see what you're gonna do? They're mystified by, my abstract performance trying to construct a video that I've seen spontaneously. And they follow me, they will follow me on YouTube or they'll make friends with me on, um, on, um, on Facebook. I have, people don't even realize that they've never met me, me before. And I'm convinced that without film, if I was just traveling around Europe without film, it would have been difficult to make friendship. Why are you speaking to me? Why are you out of nowhere? But I am making my films able to stand in the middle of a city uh, and just out of nowhere, I make friends, lots of friends, simply by involving them in this act of uh, filmmaking uh, and stuff like that. And that, that's basically also the, the, the role of the um, of masking in, in an African village. It, it, it breaks, they come out to basically to break down walls. And, yeah. And to, and to teach and to show the way of a different way of being in the world, essentially. We've got, yeah. um, I'd like to invite Wes back, actually, because Wes is going to uh, show, share some questions. Hello, hello, hello. That was a wonderful conversation already. Um, so thank you both. And as you say, uh, Samson, each time you get into one of those videos, you just want to stay there with it for a while longer. But I'm hoping that's a sign that as soon as you get into the gallery, you'll want to stay there. For a while longer as well and of course this is an odd uh, an odd space to be talking about something as as embodied and clearly tactile um as your work and actually that's one of the first questions that's come through is about the question of the mask and it's an obvious question for you mm -hmm. which was actually arisen array uh, arose out of the one of the films where um somebody had a mask on in mm -hmm. other words um What's this been like making this in the time of COVID? Has it made any difference to the way you've thought about uh, the themes in the project or did you already have them in a sense ready-made or at least have they been there with you for so long that COVID has made no difference? Yeah, I can tell you actually that, uh, and this is a very good question you've asked. I haven't uh, spoken about this, but it's very important. You should know that my work actually comes from the AIDS pandemic, you know? That's what drove it. I trained as a painter in, in Malawi for many years until my degree was as a painter and sculptor. But around that time in, in Malawi, we had this AIDS crisis, mm -hmm. the epidemic, and lots of people I knew uh, around me, especially a certain generation, were dying, actually, left and right. A lot of my professors at the University of Malawi were dying. And me sitting in a room painting didn't speak, didn't begin to capture what I was, the devastation I was seeing behind me. And one day I stopped and I made a football plastered in pages of the Bible. Uh, I don't know whether I have it, I don't have it in my room here, but um, um, it, it's an existential thing. Christianity is on the rise in, uh, oh yeah, actually, actually I have it here. It's, uh, 
it's a, it's a small sample here, uh, which is, uh, you can see the Bible page nicely quotes. And um, this was my more philosophical exploration of art. This is what connected me from my Western education in art to my African tradition. You can see already play Homo Ludens, if you like. There's a good mm -hmm. book on origins of uh, culture in play by mm -hmm. Uitiga. Mm -hmm. And already turning my Bible into a ball begins to connect me to African culture. And uh, from, from this, I started making films. And so my films have that agency already. There's a big sense of mortality in my film. If you look at my films, they, they end suddenly. They, they, the cuts are brutal. Mm -hmm. um, all these things are rehearsed in Nyao Masking as well. Nyao, Nyao Masking, you could say some people think that it's, it's very fatalistic. <laughs> you, you know, so it, it's already, I think the world has come to me. In a, in a way, I'm not surprised that I have been so busy during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and and just to, just to uh, give a bit more context Sorry. to yeah. now as well, just to, you know, from some of our conversations, there was the AIDS crisis, of course, in Malawi, in which it wasn't just professors you lost, actually, it was a good number of family members, and yes. parents, and it was a very, very significant impact on your life. My, my, my book, The Jive Talk, I feel like that Emma spoke about, is... Mm -hmm goes through AIDS, you know, yeah. my experience of the AIDS. Yeah. Uh, the way I was touched by this experience as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. And and one of the things you said in March last year, we were already talking about the sh um, different ideas and Ruskin and all sorts by that point, but something you said was, I've been through this before in terms mm -hmm. of the pandemic. Uh, and now, uh, I didn't know anyone else who was saying that. And it was very genuine that you've been through this before. And the, the governments will have a battle between if they protect the health of the populace or protect the economy. And this is, I've seen this play out before. And it was, and it was important point because so much of your work is also about the relationship of capital, property rules, mm -hmm. the economy comes through mm -hmm. very, very strongly because this stuff is life and death for people. It is the source of great exploitations, both under colonial era and also now. It can dehumanize when economies or policies separate mm -hmm. people out. And that was something that was very present in your work before, but I think has an acuteness now, that urgency of, of yeah. the gift and, and also I was just going to mention the Black Lives Matter Samson yeah. as well if you talk yeah. about that really informed the upper installation and New yeah. Liberia concept. Yeah and actually I can tell you that the reason why I came I, I proposed eventually doing my PhD to look at uh, uh, the problematic of the gift and and art is because I wanted to be self-conscious I knew that in Africa we suffered a lot AIDS because it's a structural uh, it's pretty much like uh, COVID, AIDS mm -hmm. was also very structured. In fact, I believe that traditionally AIDS in Africa would have been contained, but we found ourselves in no man's land between the gift culture and capital and the, the chaos in between where these two economies were meeting is where a lot of people died. Mm -hmm. if, you are, if you go to Africa, the villages were saved, the villagers are fine because they have their own structure, or if you were wealthy or of a certain class, you would have been, if you were well versed, if you were well assimilated to, to let's say Western structures, if you had any structure around you at all, that's kind of, you would have survived somehow because you would have had information, maybe even access to whatever. But um, Africa has also a no man's land, you know, between the gift economy and the capital. And that's where a lot of and so for me, studying the gift economy was trying to get a hold of what I have in order to maybe have some form of control over it or how mm -hmm. to empower myself in how uh, I negotiate mm -hmm. the, 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 the mm -hmm. globalized world, if you like. Because I knew that it was lack of uh, getting a grip on what was happening economically that had really yeah. knocked us down. And also New Liberia, in terms of calling that to the fore mm -hmm. within the title of the show, I mean, that was absolutely because of the John Chilembwe work and research, uh, but also around the Black Lives Matter conversation. We talked yeah. about that a lot. And mm -hmm. also the aspect which in uh, Malawi and elsewhere, it's not as straightforward as black v white. You know, you had lots of progressives, you had uh, egalitarian uh, missionaries who were white British, who were supportive of and really actually set 
uh, Chilembwe through Joseph Booth and others mm -hmm. on his path to an extent, so actively supporting a shift. So it's much more kind of a progressive, um, a progressive agenda and all sorts of allegiances that might not be so obvious now. Mm -hmm. But these conversations were heatedly informed Samson, by the Black Lives Matter, the, the huge uh, rise of that mm -hmm. in 2020. Would you speak a bit about that? Emily? Yes. So um, uh, yeah, uh, this is, um, I, I've always been kind of, from my experience here, I think I'm running 20 years, I, I've always been suspicious of, you know, I, I didn't think that you got much, you know, uh, Black activism, like racism. I just felt, oh, you just have to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, strategy, had to use strategies. Me, I'm a big fan of situationism and the situationism says you always find people in your way. So what you want is tactics and strategy moving forward. And I've always believed in that somehow that maybe activism, uh, I don't know, is it a time waster, but <laughs> you want to strategize. But uh, I think that for me, Black Lives Matter has been a real movement. It's brought change. I've noticed that institutions are listening. And I was converted, you know, coming to Oxford that there is, there, there is, you can, you, things have to be called out and things can change. Uh, but I think it's been a revolution. For a long time, I've been through waves of discussions on equality, but they seem to fizzle out. But this one somehow uh, seems to have uh, taken hold and I've seen changes, real changes brought up by this movement. And it's also encouraged me to be more open with my uh, the politics, you know? These politics, equality uh, against racial justice, you, you could consider my films a definition of, uh, I always think that the image of the black person has been created, let's say, by Hollywood, if you look at the terrible mm -hmm. films of Griffith, Griffith mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the dehumanization of black people through film, through Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I always felt that the recreation, the reclaiming of my dignity as a black person, it was through film. This was always at work. It, my films are not sepia for no reason. I am actually positioning them within history. And mm -hmm. one of those history is the, the dehumanization of Africans through ethnographic films or whether through racist films, whatever. And this is where, uh, this is a battleground. Yeah, uh, and, and so those issues were always there, but perhaps in a more abstract way, uh, and it's the movement Black Lives Matter perhaps that's really encouraged me to be forthright mm -hmm. by bringing names that perhaps wouldn't have been readily accepted like John Chilean before the fourth plinth. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether before black, well, by the way, I proposed this, uh, uh, the, the John Chilean belong before at least, you know. 2019, I think it was when you did that design, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, so yeah, was but still it's, it's, it's um, through the pandemic, I was encouraged to be more forthright, to contribute, to, to, to name my show New Liberia, definitely this is inspired by, uh, I would like to contribute to this movement in a small way, yeah. Mm. Can I ask about contribution? Um, because one of the questions, um, in fact, two of the questions, I'll put them together. Um, no. And that's about the contribution that students made mm -hmm. um, by giving their gowns. So somebody said, you engaged in your students around the act of giving by mm -hmm. asking them to share their gowns. Um, yeah. So one question is, why was that important to you? And did you expect them to be so ready to give the gowns the chop? In other words, to, to, to sort of surrender them in that way and, and repurpose them. And the other question was um, picking up, I think, on what one of the students said in the film. Mm -hmm. um, were you making a comment on deconstructing Oxford traditions or was it more about drawing parallel with African traditions or mm -hmm. is that not a, a, a kind of difference for you, uh, if I can put that it that way? Yeah, uh, well, the first question, the students, um, some student proposed this actually. I, I, so for ah. some reason, when I got funding from John Fell and from Torch, I thought this is on. We just need to go to the shops, get those gowns. I've got my contribution. But a student raised during the rest of the seminars, he said, what if we just send you gowns anonymously? I was like, ah. wow, this is it. That's, that, that's, that's perfect. You know, I had, uh, I, I intended to give my own gown, but I didn't 
expect people to join me in this act. I thought, well, I've got funding now. Maybe I should be happy enough with that. But I was really <laughs> happy when students proposed this. And, and that's in this. And they donated them uh, anonymously, which is also a big step. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I would like to tell you that gift giving is very different from charity. Sure. <laughs> this is a, uh, you know, but anyway, if you're an artist, I have nothing, especially art students. I think there's a, I always, uh, uh, I'm very forgiving. Anybody who's mm -hmm. decided to become an artist has, mm -hmm. it has one foot in this mm -hmm. gift economy. You know, it's, it, you know. So the second um, thing uh, is that, I think it's all that, it's a deconstruction, it's, but we brought in Ruskin and people ask me, how you find your Oxford? I was like, I like Oxford, but the Oxford I like is not necessarily the one with prestige or exclusion, but I like ideas of like the monastic tradition coming from the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. You see the monasteries or uh, these places of study where forms of gift giving, you know, Ruskin was aware of this. This is why he brings back this, uh, the Guild of St. George, mm -hmm. you know, all the guilds that they had basically there was also a way of avoiding exchange in the Middle Ages. If you are wealthy, you are likely to give your wealth, wealth to the church mm -hmm. and the church would distribute it. And then your neighbor would say, oh, I got this from God. Instead of saying, I got this from my neighbor who mm -hmm. has demeaned me by helping me. So um, I think that if you look at the, uh, the traditions of illuminating texts of, I mean, the, the, the subjects that Oxford had before the 19th century, for me, it's almost like as this place was one place of, 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 of in the leech wars of Oxford. For me, they, they come from a, a different economy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I find plenty of connections between, uh, I, I say there's always a difference between me between Europe and the West. Europe is all about <laughs> this gift economy and I, mm -hmm. I uh, connect with Celtic cultures with mm -hmm. um, a lot of, uh, I'm a big fan of Southern Germany. I, I go a lot in Bavaria, I go a lot in the mountains in Switzerland. I find mm -hmm. places where I can connect as an African. Mm -hmm. I, I like the Scottish Highlands. I, li I like, these are places where of the gift, these traditions that I'm talking about that are practiced in Africa, we're here too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 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 and Oxford, yes, I think the old Oxford, the areas, the monastic, which I would like to summon forth through these gowns. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually trying to get to the original Oxford, if you like. Yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's yep. the community ritualistic side as well, isn't it? It's building communities yeah, exactly. through rituals that are... Yeah, you, in Oxford, you are a scholar. Uh, being a scholar is a lifestyle. It's not mm -hmm. just about a career or trying to, it's, it's not about just a job, but, but we have all these excessive rituals, processes that for me, bring people together. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I like the rituals in the colleges. I think I've mm -hmm. uh, really made some close friends in the colleges mm -hmm. because of all these kind of uh, events. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and for me, I would want to see more of that. People think it's about phasing those out. No, the all kind of Oxford I'm looking for is more, more ceremony and less, less capital. <laughs> that's, that's a motto to put on the wall. Um. <laughs> people, uh, people always uh, are surprised when I tell them this. People think that actually the way to an ethical future is about frugality, it's about being self-denying that's a puritan ethic that gave birth to capitalism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you really want an ethical future luxury has to be on the table mm -hmm. people we can tell you've been reading ruskin again samson and studying <laughs> ruskin again it's clear that this has really informed um informed the work um we're unfortunately running out of time i think um but emma did you want to just add that uh, you've been nodding sagely in the background of, of, uh, of the little luxury not prestige i'm not talking about a kind of luxury that's shallow minded that's about no 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 okay we'll take that I as a given. understood <laughs> yeah 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 um yeah emma did you want to say kind of uh i've got one more question about the kind of materiality of the elephant uh, mm -hmm. and, and the gown in a minute, but but perhaps, I'd, yeah, did you want to add? Yeah, to I was just going to partly say that whilst this <clears> show references 
you know, historical characters and people, different eras and community rituals that people are unfamiliar with. But the whole point about art and everything else is to become more familiar with what's unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. You know, these things are really live as well. I was really struck by, you know, there's the Ruskin School of Art, which is born out of this Ruskin idea yep. originally, originally, that one observes sections of nature and aspects and difference in nature to for an individual to open your eyes and to see the world afresh. And that that's the practice. It's so you see the world afresh. Yep. And also that he had this very strong social um, equality agenda. And, and saw the inequalities there. So the Ruskin College of, in Oxford still does those amazing programs. Um, mm -hmm. And I just wanted to, I suppose, mark and nod that a lot of these things are more, are very, very live. So just at the weekend, Sasha Johnson is a young woman who's a mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter activist who got a first in social care at the Ruskin College mm -hmm. in Oxford was shot. Mm -hmm. And so there is, these things are so, they might seem poetic and aesthetic in how we're talking about them, but they come from something that's extremely grounded and in the world and in this huge confluence of how do we together as a society work out a better way to be. And there's so much difference of opinion at the moment about what mm. that is. Mm. Yes, I, I think that without, change has to come we also revolutions are fine but what do you do in the morning after yeah, they say fine you've got the world is ready for change but change to what while we ask for a different world we also have to dare to imagine what that different what what shape that different world world might take for me i've always proposed the gift economy luxury i always say that capital as a way of just introducing fake change. And if you are not prepared to think outside capital, what do you end up with just more capital? And uh, I'm not the gift economy for me is people think it's, it's associated with self denial or whatever. And for me, I think that the luxury is that people see within capitals, this is just nothing as to compare to what that economy pro promises. Um, so yes, I think that uh, for me, Black Lives Matter, they're taking a lot of stick, they are called Marxist, whatever, but I think that I can see what they're driving at. Black Lives Matter is advocating not only equality, but they can also see that perhaps what uh, generates this inequality is the kind of system that we have. And perhaps mm -hmm. real change can come if we cannot begin to consider the system. This is also a Rask, Ruskin's position. Raskin understood this. Yeah. And, and many other different value systems as well, mm -hmm. sometimes you're mm -hmm. bringing to light. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and the courage it takes actually uh, right. to stand mm -hmm. up and share experiences a, a lot. That's well, it, it already took some courage, I think, Emma, to, to put this exhibition in Modern Art Oxford to offer a, a, uh, um, a solo show to one of the Ruskin um, artists, teachers, tutors. Um, so there was courage on your part that made this possible. There's obviously courage on Samson's part in both thinking this, but also making these things. Courage on the part of the students, remaking it. My favorite bit of the, the film actually was where you, where the rough on the gown gets repurposed behind the ear. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that, that I just feel the, the, the texture of that and the the, the sort of, I don't know, somehow that's gift economy for me, is that little moment mm -hmm. where where one thing like this gets turned into that and becomes mm -hmm. something very strongly uh, embodied again. And I, I suppose my last question would be about um, the location of this exhibition in Oxford, in modern art Oxford, um, and in an Oxford where, of course, um, uh, we've just had a, uh, the, the Oxford City Council has just kind of promoted a, a, an anti-racist charter. And then, of course, at the same time, Oriel College decides that it can't quite build, bring Rhodes statue down yet. Um, and I'm wondering if, I mean, I have a fantasy. I'll just put my fantasy out there and see what either of you make of it. And that is that one day we might see these elephants actually walking down the street, down the high street. Um, it's already exciting that they're in the art gallery. Yes. Don't, don't get me wrong. But might they also get out there into the high street and tell us something about the wider Oxford? Or is that a fantasy too far? No, actually, 
somebody, I'm, I'm in conversation with the person who came to, uh, to, the, to, 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 uh, to my show and ah. he's suggesting that we do a, a grand finale of these elephants, a procession down the road. Um, he even suggested maybe an elephant fight or an elephant race. These, um, as you saw, these elephants are actually on wheels. They're very mobile. Yes. That's what and I was I'm wondering. thinking, I think that's on the table. We might as well have an event of the closing what in September, this show comes to an end. You know, we might as well have a procession. Uh, I'm listening. I actually have encouraged this guy, this individual got in touch with me that yes, I think um, that sounds like an idea. We might as well process them. <laughs> we could, and we, we are, I'll definitely look into it. I think it's- Okay, a, well, if at least two of us are having the same idea, then maybe that's a good idea. I don't know. Yes, Emma, I think, think it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> I, I am always under temptation to keep these elephants within the art world. Yeah. And in, in fact, indeed, Emma has asked me, she says, what are you going to do with the, these elephants? Well, one of the ideas I had is to install it in my office at Modeling. So mm. when you walk into yeah. my office, you just see this, uh, this elephant. That's one. But the other is, um, is this. I think I do like that this definitely these elephants call for the extension on their social dimension. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, the point of doing, of creating new art uh, of this moment and in the way that we do in modern Oxford has always been for like 50 years of it being there, is to have public conversations. That's yeah. why public institutions like us take the fourth plinth. Mm -hmm. It's to, it's not just the looking at art, it's not appreciating art quietly. It's part of a live debate about how we understand the current human condition that we're in through one subject position, often of an artist or a collective of artists, mm -hmm. exploring and making unusual things in the world. So the point very much is to have a conversation and to, to think about it in a, in a wider way for people and how that resonates with their I, own, I, invigorates their own sort of understanding of life today and their place in it. So yeah, I mean, the elephant, a, elephant breakout or an elephant procession we'll look into it yes and i'm glad that i'm getting this idea from the head of research at humanities <laughs> torch so let's do it i mean where's yeah. <laughs> well well okay let, let's explore it let's see where this goes and i mean exactly as emma says it this is we've got one conversation happening here tonight and it's a very exciting conversation um, i think the thing um, i've liked about yeah, the, the thing others. I've liked about this process is that I've involved Oxford, like where it's you, from Torch. This is very important to me. I was telling Amy that what I'm doing now wouldn't have meant anything. Like if I was just a visiting artist to Oxford, I doubt I would have wanted to do the gowns because I'm not part of the community. I, 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 but I'm glad that uh, Oxford uh, institution is coming aboard to, to, to the, I, I guess this is the kind of revolution after Black Lives Matter that institutions are realizing they cannot be bystanders, yeah. you know, they, they, they have to be part of this uh, conversation. And I'm glad that, that there's been this uh, welcoming. Yeah. Of this, uh, yeah. This I mean, yeah, and I'd say that, you know, modern Oxford's very often when we commission new work, it very often has a connection with Oxford in some mm -hmm. way, different that mm -hmm. it's the university on this occasion, and also very much exploring um, aspects of, uh, different international experiences that people have from the global majority or mm -hmm. um, all sorts of different areas of life that might not be in the most obvious established place in how people yeah, yeah. think about society. Yeah, mm. yeah. so to that, I mean, to that degree, Samson's exhibition is part of a longer story. Mm. Um, I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, but that's, I mean, that again is the courage and the genius of your curating is that it's a long story, but it's a particular intervention Absolutely. at a particular moment. Absolutely, um, it's a wonderful show. And I think um, hopefully what we've given some uh, of the people who are here now live and who'll watch this, you know, it'll go on our, our YouTube channel and, and it'll um, we'll watch this later too, is both a desire to come and see the exhibition for real um, and um, Emma, it is now open and people can come and book and so on. You book in ahead of time, please. It is yes. free. Uh, that's so there's nice space for everyone to move around without worrying about social distancing. But yet, yeah, come. It's uh, really, really, really worth a visit. And there'll also be, as of later in this week, I think, a virtual 3D rendering online as well for people who are overseas and who are not going to come along to Oxford in the next few months. 
Great. We may yet see John Chilembe on the fourth plinth. We'll have to wait and see. When's the announcement of the, because you're, we know that you're on the shortlist now and we're, that's now open and public information. When, when's the um, decision made? I can't remember. It's right okay. at the very end of June, but public can vote as well. Ah. So go online and vote. Okay, vote, vote often, um, <laughs> vote early, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. That would be, yeah. Um, uh, and obviously, th there's so much more we could have talked about. Samson hats, for example, I know that are, are a, um, a, a point of real interest, but um, mm. we have run out of time. But thank you so much, both of you, for bringing this conversation uh, to this space. Um, and um, yeah, we look forward to whatever whatever happens next. Um, Sampan, we should give you the last word, though. Is there anything else you'd like to add at the end of our conversation? Yes, uh, this is just to say thank you for hosting us at Torch uh, with me uh, from Raskin and Emma from Modern Art Oxford, Amy, who has been working as the manager of this, uh, you know, putting together my installations. Um, the Raskin students, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, make time for that, but uh, there's uh, Liz and Barbara, who is also uh, engineers on this. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to say thank you for putting this wonderful thing together. Yeah, um, no, uh, this okay. is also, uh, I guess lastly, I have to say, well, I've already said this to Emma, but thank you. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, we're breaking the rules, Samson, by saying thank you to each other in the gift <laughs> economy, but there we are, that's where we are. In this. <laughs> I, 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 thought, I, thought, I thought I would do this for you just to make you happy. Okay, <laughs> in my ideal world, maybe that was, but uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sometimes, no, no, thank you. Just, uh, just to say, I've learned a good deal tonight about, about that whole question. Um, okay. So I will, though, thank one, one last time before we take you off the stream, both Samson and Emma for a really wonderful conversation. Thanks so much. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Wes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our series of live events will continue uh, here this Thursday uh, um, on, in fact, in two days' time at 5 p.m., where we're hosting the Professor of Poetry lecture as Alice Oswald, who will give her lecture entitled Sidelong Glances, Oblique Comments on the Poetry of Marianne Moore. But for tonight, we thank you all once again for joining us and hope you might be able to join us again in, uh, on, in, in our sort of torch world of in conversations. Thank you and goodbye for now. <laughs>